All right, thank you, Clerk. Um, well, buenas tardes and bienvenidos a todos. Uh, I'll be serving as your acting chair once again. If I do this one more time, I think I get an Oscar award. Um, and actually, this will be the final time for me, too. Um, it's been a pleasure serving with you. And I mean, everybody from the nice staff behind the monitors to the po folks that sit up here front, and then all the representatives. It's been great knowing you. You're like my work family, and it's been an honor working with you. Um, this is the last regular meeting of the Borders Committee for 2022. It's been another great year for work, and we've seen some tremendous changes on the border. We're going to hear about some of them um, later in today's meeting. Uh, we've returned to in-person meetings, which is great, but we also have a hybrid option to allow public participation and remote presenters, which is a big benefit, especially for all our committees. And of course, we must be cautious as winter is near flu okay before we start i'd like to let the clerk to confirm we have a quorum thank you chair we do have a quorum would you like me to do a full roll call um is that appropriate i would look to legal counsel and we say we have been doing that uh just as a uh, for the visually impaired who might be attending via zoom make it so thank you for south county chair sankey here for east county council member shu Oh, I'm sorry, and Councilmember Koval. Here. Thank you, and Councilmember Chu is also present. Uh, the City of San Diego is absent. For the County of San Diego, uh, Supervisor Anderson. Here. Thank you. Imperial County is absent. For North County Coastal, Councilmember Drucker. Here. Thank you, and, for, and North County Inland is absent. <clears throat> for the advisory members, for Riverside County, Crystal Ruiz. Here. Thank you, for the Republic of Mexico, Natalia Figueroa. For the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association, Chairman Welch. Here. Thank you. And Caltrans and the San Diego County Water Authority are absent. The Southern California Association of Governments and Orange County are also absent. And that concludes the roll call. We do have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, please note, simultaneous interpretation is available at this meeting. I'd like to ask our interpreter to briefly explain how this feature works. Would you please do that? Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. I will repeat the following information in English. Este es un aviso por parte del intérprete para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación. Favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación que aparece como un globo terráqueo y seleccione Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil del Zoom, presione los puntos suspensivos y luego Interpretation y luego el idioma. Si se ha unido a la reunión de hoy en una sala de juntas de Sandag y necesita interpretación al español, por favor dirija hacia la recepción del piso 7 y solicite un receptor. El receptor se parece a un pequeño iPod y se puede utilizar para escuchar la reunión en español. Simplemente sostenga el auricular junto a su oído y la interpretación comenzará automáticamente. To use the Zoom interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click onto the interpretation icon, a world, and select either English or Spanish. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, or tablet, please press the ellipsis and then interpretation and then choose your language. If you're joining us today at Sandag and need interpretation into Spanish, please check out a headset from the receptionist on the seventh floor. The headset looks like a little iPod and comes with an earpiece which you can use to hear the meeting in Spanish. Simply hold the earpiece to your ear and the interpreter will come automatically. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Okay, now we've heard those instructions. I've got the following, uh, following to read. Respectfully acknowledge that we live and work on traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of tribal nations, including the Kumeyaay, Luceno, Copeño, and Cahuilla peoples. We share strong historical and cultural roots that unite us with all our neighbors. As I said, this will be our last meeting of 2022. Unfortunately, we are back to in-person meetings, um, we, but we do also have a hybrid format. Borders Committee members are reminded if, if you participate via Zoom, you are considered a member of the public and will not be considered a voting member of the body. Um, let's see, members of the public, including the Borders Committee members that would like to speak on an item, please use the raise hand icon on the Zoom toolbar. When you're called on by the chair or the clerk, you'll be unmuted by Sandag staff. If you're calling in by phone, you may need to enter star six to unmute yourself. After your comments, you will be muted by Sandag staff. If you're calling into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone. If you'd like to comment on an item, all comments, whether emailed or live, will be made part of today's permanent meeting record. Any questions before we begin? All right, super important meeting today, at least for me in my region, South County, in that we're going to hear about the Tijuana sewage issue, which is fabulous, and the San Isidro Mobility Hub is also part of today's agenda. Uh, absolute game changer for that area. Um, 
and, and, and very exciting changes happening down there. There's much to celebrate as we head towards the new year, but before we get there, we have an opportunity to commemorate November, November as U.S. Native American Heritage Month. One of the many things that makes San Diego County unique is that the region is home to more federally recognized tribes and reservations than any other county in the United States. The region's 17 sovereign tribal nations have distinct governments that exercise land use authority over 18 reservations. They are critical partners in achieving our vision for a brighter future for all. This past month, the California Energy Commission awarded the Viejas Tribe $31 million grant for a tribal long duration energy storage project that will support statewide grid reliability. Additionally, the federal government awarded Paula and Manzanita Tribes with two ARB enhanced quality air quality monitoring competitive grants totaling over $450,000. Sandag's government-to-government -government relationship with the tribe began in 2001 when Sandag Vintage envisioned this particular committee, the Borders Committee. And when I came on this committee, I thought of our borders as county borders, not necessarily tribal borders. And it's been a tremendous learning experience for me to know the relationship that's so important in our region with our tribal friends, neighbors, and, and, uh, and partners in making our region a better place. Our collaboration has evolved to include tribal summits, the Tribal Transportation Techno Technical Working Group, and an MOU with the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association that elevated tribes to be advisory members on our board and on our uh, PACs. Today, Sandag continues solidifying our government-to-government -government relationships with the tribes through dependent collaboration on housing, safety, climate, and mobility. And I'd like to take an opportunity to recognize Chairman Welsh from Verona being here today and ask him if he has any remarks to share with us. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and thank you for, for saying day for voting and allowing the tribes the opportunity to have a place at the table we never had before. We really appreciate that, and we honor honor our working relationship with Sanday. Thank you so much. We're all so much better together. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to our agenda. Our first agenda is public comments. Um, do we have any public comments uh, not related to an agenda item on today's agenda? Thank you, Chair. We do have a few. Uh, we have two in-person public comments. I'll start with uh, Claudia Bustuerto and we'll be followed by David Perez Tejada. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, buenos dias a todos. Claudia Basurto de Tijuana Innovadora, Vice President of Binational Affairs. And I just want to uh, come in person to congratulate Hector Venegas. He is now part of the Hall of Fame, del Paseo de la Fama of Tijuana Innovadora, because... <laughs> he has been very compromised with the region always a great advisor for Tijuana Innovadora. He has been uh, since the beginning with us and we really appreciate all your help and all the uh, knowledge that you have been um, distributed, eh, que has estado eh, compartiendo con toda la gente de México. So thank you very much and uh, thanks for inviting us. Noticias fantástico. One more, one more round of applause for our... Anybody else from your queue, Francesca? Uh, yes, David, you can go ahead. Uh, David, Dav David is a, a wonderful partner in Sandag, David Perez Tejada, uh, um, <laughs> and we're glad you're here. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, voy a hablar en español para hacerlo más rápido. Héctor, muchísimas felicidades, muy merecido el reconocimiento, y me uno y me congratulo a lo que Claudia comentó. Eh, a la vez, este, felicitar eh, en, en su última reunión, desearle mucho éxito a Bill Sankey, ha sido un gran aliado y este de la mega región Calibaja le deseamos mucho éxito en sus proyectos y este pues felicidades y le voy a ceder el uso de la voz está conectado virtualmente Saúl de los Santos él está ahorita en España pero es un eh, gran amigo es subsecretario él de planeación te dejo la voz Saúl para que termines en estos dos minutos y medio estás ahí Saúl I don't, can, can, can we connect him? Yes. Please. Can see you find the on button. Saul de los Santos. Thank you. Thank, thanks for having us today. Um, uh, I'll be quite brief because um, David has already taken half a minute of, of the three. Um, just to uh, uh, tell everyone, pardon? Can you, can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you and please take all the time you need. Uh, 
thank you, thank you, uh, Bill. Um, well, uh, just to put it, I'm uh, under Secretary of Economy for the State Government of Baja. I worked together with David for the past year. And just as a reference, for the past several months, we have been exploring possibilities of collaboration with Sandec, via Hector, and specifically with our Director of Statistics, looking at um, evaluating the um, economic or the sustainable development goals from United Nations as a mega region initiative. And from that um, came to the table uh, an initiative, a separate initiative that we consider to be quite useful for the region from UN Habitat, their program related to binational metropolitan regions, which is called the Metro Lab Initiative. So we're looking at uh, working together in that sense and expanding the opportunities for collaboration in the binational sense. And I think this would be a great opportunity for us to explore more possibilities of um, uh, having a, a better understanding of, of the region, the needs, and how we can better understand and serve our common uh, efforts. So in that sense, uh, I look forward to working with you guys. I, I, we have a great team with David and Benjamin Castro from our side and also from Sandak with the leadership of, of Hector Vanegas. Um, thanks for having me here and I look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you so much, Sal, for being with us. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that we as an organization look for every opportunity to partner with um, folks who are trying to make our region better. And recognizing that our region crosses a border is so much more important as we move forward. Um, thank you for your efforts, Saul and, and Hector. I, I assume that going forward during the coming year, we'll have more contacts with them and find out more about that UN program. Yep. I see the nodding head, so we'll call that a, a scent. All right. Uh, Terry, do you have one more? One uh, more public, public comment, comment. exactly. Thank go you. ahead. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, Blair Beekman, you can go ahead when you're ready. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, I've been, I'm new to the area and I come from the San Francisco Bay Area. I used to live here in San Diego in the late 80s. And uh, after all these years, I've returned here for the warm ocean and warm air. And um, I've been learning the practices of tech accountability and uh, openness. Uh, in the future of, uh, of a local community. And it's really interesting work how to talk about its uh, surveillance and data collection with technology mainly. Uh, that, you know, there can be uh, real open practices and accountable practices and learning how to do that at the local neighborhood level. Uh, it's my hope it can grow, uh, you know, uh, exponentially um, and, and, and collectively to develop a future good course for this country in concepts of peace and open democracy as how to uh, create and make decisions in decision making. So with that all said, it's, it's really interesting to be down here at an inter international border. And I'm wondering how these uh, practices can be applied to uh, you know, national border issues. You'll be talking about the importance of the trolley coming up next and, and the incredible work you're doing with it. And uh, I'm really interested. Oh, and I, I suppose uh, with the um, I, the the other OT Mesa uh, border issues that, you know, uh, uh, Buttigieg had just recently toured, I think along with possibly the president has, um, you know, what could be tech practices there that we can talk about at the national border uh, to consider open public policies, minimal use practices, and accountability. Um, I'm interested in that. And so thanks for the meeting. Uh, it's an, it's a, an important beginning process in my life, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Blair, for your interest in our organization. Stay in touch. Uh, do we have any member comments for today? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just salute an event that was last night in Tijuana. Uh, it was held at the Culinary School of the Arts, and four noted chefs from both sides of the border cooked a celebratory dinner in honor of the 200th anniversary of binational diplomatic relations between Mexico and the United States. It was a fantastic event. Natalia from the consulate was there. It was hosted by Carlos, uh, our, our friend from the Mexican consulate here on this side, as well as Tom, our, our U.S. consul in Tijuana. Uh, probably 150 people. Great meal. Uh, but what was, was so rewarding was to watch the students from the culinary school work with these four luminaries of Bahamed cuisine, both from our side and their side of the border. And boy, was it really cool to see the kids. Big grins on their face. The meal was fantastic. Who, who knew you could do turkey with mole? But it was magnificent. Um, okay, and so no more member comments. Let's move on to our next item. Um, our agency report, Victoria Stack, was going to deliver out today. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. It's been an exciting day here at Sandag. This morning, our CEO, Hassan, was with Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg on his return visit to San Diego to visit the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. As you know, earlier this year, Caltrans and Sandag received the largest grant from the infra program for the project. President Biden was also recently in town. He spoke about the importance of the Low Sand Rail Corridor. Just prior to the president's visit, Hassan was invited to Washington, D.C. to join the president in celebrating the Infrastructure Talent P Pipeline Challenge. This Monday, November 21, marks the one-year anniversary opening of the Midcoast Trolley Extension. There's been no doubt that the Youth Opportunity Pass has helped to make this project a huge success. Nearly three times as many youth rode the, the transit project this fall as compared to months prior to the implementation of the Youth Opportunity Pass. In fact, since this first year opening, more than 2 million riders have used the trolley. We're joining MTS this afternoon for a rider appreciation event at the Balboa Station, and we hope that you will all join us there. In September, the board directed the staff to move forward with a focused amendment to the 2021 regional plan to remove the road user charge and prepare a supplemental environmental document for the board to consider this year. Staff is working on the amendment and the supplemental uh, document will be ready for the board and public review this spring. Um, we are also in the process of kicking off our 2025 regional plan. Additionally, we are continuing to work and make progress on the airport transit connection. We will have a connectivity concept study that will bring to the board of directors early next year. In an effort to better communicate with all, with all of you about the work that Sandag is doing, we're proud to announce the official launch of, of our new website. This has been a long time in the making and will continue to be a work in progress. In addition to being easy to use, another function of this launch is the introduction of the new technology system for agendas, which you'll see here today. Hopefully you've had a chance to check this out, and if you have any questions, please let staff know. Uh, finally, I want to give an update on the plans for the new Sandag offices. Last month, Hassan mentioned that Sandag, the Sandag lease at 41 B Street is, is set to expire September 2023. To assist staff in evaluating office space, Sandag re recently entered into an agreement with a local real estate broker. This new contract with Range Partners is noted in this month's CEO Delegated Actions Report and is, act is actually on number, item number 10 on that agenda. Staff will continue to bring information to the board on a regular basis on the process of obtaining a new building and securing new office locations. Thank you, and that concludes my report, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Let's start with public comment on that particular item. Francesca, do we have anybody with public comment on the agency report? We do not, thank you. Thank you. Any member comments or questions for Victoria? Okay, moving right along. Consent agenda time. We'll approve the meeting minutes, um, and our vote will be by um, by hand. Uh, I will go ahead and make the motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second for that? Se second, uh, second by Joel Anderson, Supervisor Anderson. Thank you. Um, any public comments on this item? No, we do not. Okay, vote by hand, please, committee members. Thank you, and that item passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you, Francesca. All right, moving on to today's report items, we're going to hear from the San Ysidro Mobility Hub folks. Zach Hernandez, are you here, Zach? All right, outstanding. Let's hear about the neat things that are going to happen along the border. Maybe a little improvement on the McDonald's building, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member Sankey. Thank you, uh, members to the Borders Committee. 
Um, just want to start out by uh, echoing the congratulations to Hector. I've had the pleasure of working with him for the last five years and learning from him. So I know the importance of his work and the caliber in which he does it. So I just want to take some time for that. But for those who don't know me, my name is Zach Hernandez. I'm a planner here at Sandag. Uh, I work within the mobility planning section. Um, and so today I'm really excited to be here to present on the San Cedro Mobility Hub. This is kind of intended as a, a reintroduction to the project. The last time we presented on this particular project to the Borders Committee was almost a year ago to the date um, today. So um, this is somewhat of a reintroduction, a little bit of a status update on where we are, kind of a, a description of our approach overall. But um, just to start with a little context that this group uh, really well knows, acknowledging the fact that San Diego is obviously not an island. Um, the daily exchange of people, ideas, commerce, and culture happening every day through our, our borders is just as much part of our DNA as anything else. And our binational identity uh, is a major strength and a huge factor that really sets us apart, not just from you know, similar cities or, or other uh, regions throughout the state or the country, but really the world. And given the significance of the exchange happening every day at our border, the 2021 re regional plan really sets out to implement a vision that reflects that understanding. And it's through specific projects and strategies and investments um, to enhance that border dynamic to make the, the regional um, transportation system more efficient, both in the border region and throughout. And the project that we're going to talk about today is a, a really big part of that. So some of the ways that the regional plan envisions to transform mobility throughout the region, but also uh, centered at the border is really multifaceted. We know that some of it is gonna come from technology and systems to improve the way that we manage and facilitate movement to and from the border for people and goods. Some of it is gonna come from more and more robust infrastructure for transportation services and mobility options. Um, and a really critical way that we also propose to improve cross-border mobility is through implementing mobility hubs. Uh, investing in those connection points where people access the actual mobility services. In the case of the border, San Cedro has been front and center of that conversation and has been the primary workhorse facilitating the cross-border flow of people for decades. And this project is really centered in that reality. Uh, so every day, between 80 and 90,000 people are crossing just northbound through San Ysidro alone. Um, and they're crossing to get to school, to get to work, to be with family, to run their businesses, everything in between. About 20,000 of them are crossing on foot as pedestrians, and they're all landing at a transit center and a plaza space uh, that has really not been updated um, in terms of the, the layout configuration and its capacity for the last 20 years or more. So when it comes to our approach for advancing our long-term vision at San Ysidro, we obviously have our longer-term goals and aspirations, but we have our, we're acknowledging the fact that the site and the people who use it every day have been enduring many challenges that exist today for some time. And the infrastructure generally has outlived its utility and we need to take a really hard look at how we can improve the transit center, the existing one, as we're building towards a future vision. So over the last few months, uh, we've been started with the, the planning work to really understand the site better. Um, we've been going to visit the site for ourselves, experience the challenges on the, on the ground floor, coming through the previous planning documentation, talking to stakeholders to get a better understanding of how the site is operating and what the challenges are. Specifically, what, what's been rising to the top are the three things that you see on screen here. And the first one really leads into the second two, or, or the other two. But the first one, if I could just highlight this, is the really constrained footprint that the site is working with. Every inch is very precious. You have a number of modalities trying to connect to that space. And all of that kind of confluence of different modes really impairs how much capacity you have to serve people, um, given the limited space. Um, the second one here, because of that limited space and all the modalities converging, you have these conflict points that arise where pedestrians, vehicles, and transit modes are, are currently meeting. And so you have an impact to pedestrian connectivity and safety uh, occurring because of that. Overall, the configuration of the space itself, just the way it's laid out, often leads to confusion for users. It isn't really optimized for better user experience. I like to describe it as a little bit overcomplicated to use that site. Um, but frankly, what, we, what we've been noticing in all the planning documentation and talking to stakeholders, these are the three things that are really kind of rising to the top and are our focus for, for where we want to start with San Ysidro. So with that in mind, our, our approach to the overall project includes two phases. A phase one that 
generally tries to answer the question, how can we improve and get more out of the existing San Ysidro Transit Center while we build towards a longer-term vision? But how can we address those long-standing issues, issues, those current issues? And this is really stemming from the fact that we've heard from the community themselves that they're all for a grand vision, a long-term vision for San Ysidro, but they're really weary of having to wait another 10, 15, 20 years to see investment be made or improvements to be made. Um, so this is really grounding us in that, helping us address that concern, show the community that we're serious about bringing improvements to San Ysidro, like I said, while we build towards a longer-term vision. So phase two is where that longer-term vision, our aspirations for what we'd like to see in the future really come to the surface. And phase two is where we get to incorporate a broader, more comprehensive array of cons considerations around mobility, around land use development, uh, around state-of-the-art technology to really enhance not just what's there today, but what we see really accommodating the, the demand that we anticipate in the future. So the vision overall, um, and it's still to, to be kind of a TBD with lots of public input, but what we're thinking so far for phase two is that at a bare minimum, we have to accommodate the future connections that are planned in the regional plan. Um, so these are bigger, more robust mobility options. We need to showcase human-centered human -centered and innovative design to reflect the binational and cultural significance of San Ysidro. And we need to explore land use opportunities within and near the mobility hub that could support and also benefit from investments in the mobility infrastructure. Uh, just in terms of time, timeline really high level, I'll go into detail in the next slide, but in terms of where we are, we've kicked off the planning work for phase one already. Uh, we're a couple months into that work. And we're starting to scratch the surface with some of the fun stuff of that initial uh, task order, that initial planning scope of work, which is putting together some concepts, putting our heads together and deciding, you know, what are some things that we could do? What are some measures that, that would help us address those existing challenges and that we could feasibly implement um, in the next five to 10 years, hopefully sooner? Um, as we get to about the middle of next year, we'll be ready to start the planning work for phase two, because at that point in time, we'll understand more or less what are the measures that we can do in the near term. And then in phase two, when we start that work, we'll begin to answer the questions of what comes after that. How do we build on that, expand on that? And what does the ultimate San Ysidro Mobility Hub facility look like? So we talked about the site challenges, um, and so they're over here to the left just for good measure, but any good project needs pretty clear goals. For phase one of San Ysidro Mobility Hub, we've sim simplified it down to three overarching things that you'll see right here in the middle. The first two are a little bit self-explanatory or kind of a given, but obviously we want to build towards a more optimized transit center in terms of mobility, in terms of safety, access, overall user experience. But to just quickly draw your attention to the third one, this is kind of key because we ultimately want to prime the site for near-term investment, for better operations in the near term. And by, by that, I mean within the next five to 10 years. And we're going to definitely identify things that we could even implement sooner than that. Um, like I said, this is all building towards a future mobility hub. So this is, these are things that we could tackle soon. Um, and then we have more tangible objectives to help get us there. So these are the actionable steps. Obviously, we want to find a way to increase capacity for transit and the modes that serve San Ysidro. By doing so, we also want to remove or at the very least reduce the number of conflict points, conflict points that exist. And we also want to take a look at how we can redesign the plaza space to prioritize user experience. Maybe that means consolidating, cons consolidating and streamlining uh, some of the existing services um, and facilities that are out there, but also showcasing mobility hub features. Um, so this, in a nutshell, is kind of our, our North Star, if you will, for phase one of this work. And then this slide kind of is our roadmap for phase one, if you will, at least for the planning work that we have ongoing. And so you see a handful of tasks that might look familiar if you've been you know, closely involved with planning efforts before. But just to say, task, task two that you see on screen, the stakeholder outreach and public outreach, that's stuff that we've kicked off already and that we'll continue to do throughout the duration of the project. Um, we've done as much as we could in terms of understanding uh, the existing conditions, putting together, uh, you know, our thinking about what are the, the key challenges, how can we assess performance, what are the types of criteria that help us understand that at a planning level. And then task four is uh, what we kind of have, have ahead of us over the next couple months. This is us uh, coming up with some preliminary concepts to have, you know, the public react to, stakeholders to react to, provide input on, refine them as we go, um, assessing them based on the pros and cons, and then hopefully coming to some sort of conclusion on which ones do we think give us the most bang for the buck and are, most, are gonna give us the, the highest level of efficiency for the transit center. 
Um, phase, task five is a phasing implement, implementation strategy. Really key for this is gonna be trying not to disrupt existing service as we go, to, go towards construction and actually implementing this stuff. Um, it's a, a, a site that's really, really high in demand. There's an incredible amount of foot traffic as we talked about a couple slides ago, but it's gonna be really key for us to, to do this in a way that um, limits the impact to existing service. And then task six is an engineering package to get us a head start on the environmental and uh, environmental clearance work and design work, et cetera. It's kind of a, not typical for a planning level study, but this is us trying to be expeditious through the process. And then obviously a, a final wrap up, a summary report, going back out to the community to talk about how it went, how the process kind of unfolded um, and where we see, see things going with phase two with the mobility hub, mobility hub planning work. And so just to touch really briefly on our approach to stakeholder outreach, um, we have a core group of agencies helping us kind of initially brainstorm ideas, put them down and to document them, put them onto paper and then prepare them for, for public input. And those agencies are represented by SANDAG, MTS, um, City of San Diego and Caltrans. So as we go, there's gonna be an iterative process when we get to key milestones that obviously we have to reach out to in a proactive sense, you know, all the actors at the government, community, and industry level um, to get public input and also buy-in for this project. But as we go, we're gonna hit key milestones. And the first two here are what we've already kind of made a lot of, covered a lot of groundwork on in terms of stakeholder outreach. So we've done a lot of work to, to familiarize a project uh, publicly, get in front of stakeholders, schedule briefings, schedule presentations, just like this one, um, to familiarize people with the, the general project goals. The second kind of wave of public outreach that we're planning to do is sharing how we you know, plan to assess system performance. So getting some buy-in on you know, how we're gonna measure success with this project. And then three is kind of a critical one. We're gonna share you know, some preliminary concepts, our initial ideas about what are the measures that we can actually go implement and do we think they're feasible? Do we think they're achievable? To get public input, um, as I said, through kind of an iterative process. Then four, we're gonna come back and share how we re refined and th those design concepts, how we integrated that input and share a comparison analysis that says, you know, this might be the preferred just based on these planning level criteria. And then finally, we'll come back, like I said, uh, with a final wrap up, share the outcomes and discuss what comes next. So included this side, slide just to paint a picture of how complex and the just the breadth, the array of project stakeholders that, that we need to reach out to in order to really have our, our bases covered when it comes to you know, any work that happens along the border. Um, and every time we go out and do stakeholder outreach, this list grows and there's a whole database of project contacts that we've compiled. Uh, but I'll just leave this up for a moment just to talk about how our stakeholder outreach, um, our general approach to this is instead of uh, kind of inviting folks from the community uh, to come to these big workshops, these big webinars. We're, co we're going to the community. We're briefing stakeholders on an individual basis, on a more intimate basis to get their input. Um, and that's generally uh, the way that we're approaching stakeholder outreach. So just to highlight that for you too. Um, obviously we're doing presentations and updates and reports to, to the existing forums, the existing binational consortiums and groups and committees, et cetera, to get the word out. Um, but they're really kind of uh, intimate and, and tangible kind of feedback. We're, we're really trying to hone in on that um, really intimate level outreach. So briefings and presentations, that sort of thing. So mentioning that to, for any of the stakeholders listening online as well or in the room, please reach, please reach out for a, a briefing, a project discussion so we can uh, get your input. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up with this slide just to mention um, over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna launch our, our main project webpage um, and it's gonna be housed in the new and improved sandag.org. Um, well, we also have a project email set up at sandagstudio at sandag.org. So please reach out via there or via my personal contact if you have it. Uh, and I'll make sure to follow up with you um, soon after. But um, I'll leave it there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Zach, very, very much for that great report. A lot of the good things happening. It's funny when I think about how many years we've been talking about something happening down there. Now, see, apparently something is going to happen just as I leave. Maybe I should have left a long time ago. Um, can we have our public comments, please, Francesca? Thank you, Chair. We do have two public comments. First will be Blair Beekman, who will be followed by Karina Contreras. Thank you. Blair, go ahead. All right. Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Um, 
it, it wasn't mentioned. My first meetings here were in October, where they uh, very interestingly mentioned that they're thinking of uh, building a the trolley uh, into Tijuana itself. And that to me was amazing to hear. It was really nice to hear and real positive. Uh, I think uh, in the era we're living in to find positive things of our better selves, uh, it's nice when that happens. And uh, that wasn't mentioned here today. So I guess it's not quite fully settled yet, but a real good luck in those efforts and what it implies, a really hopeful future, I think. Um, we're trying to come out of an era of 9-11, of the 2008 recession, and of COVID. I'm really trying to look for what is our positive, sustainable future ideas, and what are just really good, helpful things for ourselves. And I think uh, guidelines and, and examples and legal precedents around um, uh, technology practices and the future of technology in local communities and neighborhoods does some amazing work. And I'm interested how, you know, it's good civil protections ideas and it's uh, open public policies, it's, it's guidelines that ask for, you know, good accountable practices from ourselves. How can that be applied to the many issues that will be taking place uh, in the rebuilding of the future of the border area? Um, you know, I'm interested just, um, it, it's nice work and, and, and to be able to apply that to to issues at the border and and uh, and and for what uh, the Mexican government can understand also I think it's a way to really build a partnership and a future of what are sustainable good practices and kind of our better human characteristics of ourselves as as a as a country and uh, you know what it brings out the better practices of what this country can be about basically and it's with that said, how does that then connect with uh, Mexico and Mexican practices of what they feel is openness and accountability? Because they'll have their own concepts of, of those sort of things. And then that builds just a better and better overall practices of our future that are, they're designed to build you know, open democracy where we all have a part in the process of asking questions that builds ideas of peace and not war, basically. Uh, you know, it's you know, if when you build technology at the border, can I start asking what exactly is that technology placed up there? How long is that data going to be held for? Can I look at that data in some form? You know, to be able to ask those sort of questions simply and easily, that should be an interesting goal to work towards. It's a it's a idealistic goal, but it's the sort of things I hope we can talk about here that can really help organize yourselves and all the work you'll be doing. For this item, thank you. Thank what you. Is, Next, we'll go to Karina Contreras. That's hitting your. That's in your three-minute mark. Well done, Blair. Karina, go ahead. Yes. Hello. My name is Karina Contreras. I'm calling in from uh, Climate Action Campaign as their transportation policy advocate. Um, just keeping my eyes on this uh, wonderful project, um, but I do have to say a few things. Uh, that the community of San Ysidro has been waiting for so long for uh, much needed improvements that are being discussed and having to wait uh, more than five years for those to come uh, to fruition in this phase one uh, would be um, perhaps, you know, the, the goal can be changed to put forward some uh, quick build projects that can address some of the pedestrian issues um, that this project is attempting to address in phase one uh, so that the timeline can be shortened and the community can see, uh, you know, progress moving forward and, and that by itself increases the buy-in from the rest of the community. Um, I also wanted to uh, point out that on the list of community um, stakeholders and engagement um, there's a lot of great uh, community outreach. Um, however, I'm not sure if this fits under the general outreach portion, but I didn't see anything specifically with school districts um, and school um, aged uh, youth and young adults. Um, and I think that's a really important population to address when we're talking about binational uh, travel and, and different mobility options. I know that the overall goal of this uh, mobility project is to increase uh, mobility uh, access and choices 
and uh, that the end goal also is to uh, have a, a big mode shift um, from single uh, use, um, single occupancy vehicles to uh, you know fixed rail, trolley, um, buses, walking, different types of active transportation, right? Like cycling. Uh, so um, I think it would be really important to address um, a constituency that that moves uh, through our borders, and, and that would be uh, those in education, um, students, uh, and possibly even uh, employees uh, from these different uh, institutions and in, in uh, educational um, careers. So. Thank you so much. I, I really look forward to um, seeing this project uh, unfold and it's going to be great for our region as a whole, um, let alone for these immediate communities that have been suffering uh, with so much air pollution uh, that if we can do anything to address that in a, a much quicker fashion, um, that would be very much appreciated uh, for uh, now and for the long term. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Contreras. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Border Committee members, any questions or comments for Zach on this particular project? Dave, you're reaching for your mic. Go ahead. Um, great project. Um, I've used this border uh, from like 2008 to 2017 or so on a monthly basis to visit my company in, uh, in Tijuana that develops software. And uh, it extremely confusing uh, to cross the border as a pedestrian and come back. And so I really appreciate Sandag working on this and um, look forward to seeing it uh, implemented. Any other member comments or questions? Who's good on that? I'd, I'd like to, oh, go ahead, Jack, please. Sir, just as an alternate uh, member of the committee, I'd like to make a, a quick comment. Um, I've been known to give uh, planners uh, challenges so I, I thought I'd throw another one out here. Um, so in, in looking at your presentation, which, which I liked, uh, it's, its topic and approach. My comment, however, though, is when I look at the objectives of the program, what I see missing is improving the health of the community at the border, uh, improving uh, uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases, and, and a number of other things. That, to me, should be primary goals of, a, of the mobility hub. Typically, those are listed as uh, co-benefits, and later, even worse, they become things that we have to mitigate against um, because we have to do something and it's not, not mitigable. So I think in the planning process, we need to start changing things. It is not just about moving people. It's about making a better community, healthier community, and improving the world. So that's my challenge to planners at Sandag change your planning process, don't, re re don't rely on mitigation, come up with a better plan, a better transportation system. And that's what's gonna help us, um, I think, uh, do what we really wanna uh, deal with. When I look at the, one of the goal statements above, right above you, Zach, is pursuing a brighter future for all. And in this case, all means people who have to cross the border. Uh, it is, does not stop at the border. And I'm so glad that uh, we're working toward that end as well, that we don't uh, stop at the border when we think about that. So anyway, uh, just thought I'd put that ch challenge out there so that in the future, the goal is to make everything better, not just movement from one place to another. Thanks, Jack, appreciate that. Zach, could I have you um, sort of chime in a little bit on, on your philosophy and as this project moves forward, incorporating those goals that, that Council Member Shu just talked about? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think he rightly mentions that it's not always at the forefront when you see this like planning framework to come together for various projects. Although we know, and if you go and visit that site, you, you can feel it for yourself, the, the public health uh, factor, um, the, just the, the outcomes that we want to achieve at the border, um, at the ground level, that's where you feel and see them the most. But um, there is a, a benefit to to us, a regional agency being involved in so many different um, uh, avenues and, and and groups and committees and different um, things that involve you know public health and that involve environmental uh, 
elements. Um, one of the, one of the things that I'm trying to bring up, but not very eloquently, is our work on air quality in terms of AB 617, uh, the program that that looks at strengthening community-based uh, air quality monitoring pro programs. Um, just this past Wednesday night, I think it was, um, listening in on a steering committee meeting, but. You know that's that's front and center, and then once you have you know those those platforms that are focused on one aspect of you know daily life, what what ultimately bleeds into it is everything else. Um, just a quick example in that meeting, you know, 20 minutes of it was dedicated to talking about the Tijuana River watershed, um, the the impacts that um, pollution has not just on on daily life down there, but you know. Um, Thinking about the future and thinking about uh, generations that have that have come to kind of have to wrestle with that, and it was kind of eye-opening to hear from the community that you know they're there to talk about air quality, but it's all these other things: it's traffic, it's mobility, it's air quality, it's environmental outcomes, et cetera, public health. But um, just to say that it's definitely on our radar, and it's definitely uh, something that we, we try to put at the forefront of our work. Obviously, the, the tools that we have at our disposal, our, dis our disposal are for. Um, improving mobility infrastructure. So that's kind of where things uh, start, but it's a point well taken. Thank you. I'll just add real quick. I also serve on the Air Pollution Control District uh, for, for San Diego. And I'm gonna start pushing forward a, a goal for our region. So you're familiar with the, uh, the uh, Cal environmental screening maps. We have parts of that map and San Diego is part of that in which the color is either orange or red. In five years, let's see if we can change the color of those, those maps. That should be one of our goals uh, in our region. And uh, we can do it because we know where the pollution is coming from. Uh, so to me, uh, uh, that should be a goal. I hope that's the goal of the Air Pollution Control District. And then we're gonna move that forward as an environmental review for other agencies, in this case, uh, Sandag, with how, how we're moving forward. Thanks, Jack. So concurrent to this, this your first phase one, you're gonna be working on a project that is getting attention from another part of the planning world, uh, the elevated tracks with the tracks continuing into Tijuana. Um, how are you factoring in sort of that into your planning? I'm, I'm reminded of other cities in the United States that have repurposed rail right-of-ways um, to the benefit of pedestrians and others, whether it's the High Line in, in uh, New York or the, the changes they made in Boston uh, by moving the cars off the, off the uh, right-of-ways and creating those park spaces. If the, trucks, if the trolley trucks were actually elevated, even if we didn't complete the segment into Tijuana, opening up that space without the trolley cars down there would be a huge win and, and probably not a phase one win, frankly, in terms of the planning that it would take to do that. But, but whether we built the trolley into Tijuana or not, elevating those tracks or is, is seemingly a, a, a good idea or moving them. Yeah, um, one of the, I, I had that timeline slide up to kind of hint that those questions are the things that we're looking to answer um, right now, actually, we're kind of scratching the surface with putting together our very initial conceptual kind of ideas around what are the things that we need to do to, you know, increase capacity for transit, but also make the space easier to use for pedestrians and all the site users. One of the key um, questions that we're trying to take a hard look at right now is what would we have to do with that LRT tracking? Would the terminus have to move? Would it have to be elevated? All the things you kind of just brought up. So, so those are the things that we're wrestling with right now. Luckily, we have a consultant team on board to help us answer some of the more detailed engineering questions. Um, and then that'll get kind of documented down into a draft you know, set of uh, concepts for the, the community to provide input on. Right. Well, I just hope that this planning process works in conjunction with and, and, and not necessarily just parallel to uh, the additional planning that's going on with that, that link with Tijuana Elevated. Yeah, just to mention, we, we have had a couple of early conversations with the Cordoba team, the private sector group, uh, proposing yeah. that concept. Um, kind of shared some early ideas just to talk about, you know, are we precluding, you know, a potential cross-border trolley? Does this spacing, what kind of spacing needs are going to be required? And so far through those discussions, we haven't found any uh, red flags or things that would preclude both things from happening in parallel. So that's good news. Good. Well, I think one of our one of our uh, public speakers talked about getting things done sooner rather than later. I look forward to seeing that the low hanging fruit implemented as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Any other comments? That concludes Zach's report, and we move on to our next agenda item: um, the United States Mexico Canada Agreement USMCA Tijuana River Watershed Binational Framework on Addressing Transborder Water Issues. Uh, we have Doug Lydon with us from EPA. Doug's a friend of ours from many years, and uh, will, as this project go forward, become an even, maybe we'll even make you a family member, Doug. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead with your report. 
Thank you, committee members, for the invitation to be here. I was with a number of you a couple weeks ago in Mexico City at the um, the San Diego Chambers uh, delegation, and there was a water meeting. And one of the questions that came up was, why is EPA just sitting on its hands and, and doing nothing with the 300 million that we were uh, allocated from Congress? And I that reflected actually an editorial that came out not too long ago in the Tribune that said essentially the same thing. And I, I it made me really appreciate these types of forum that allow us to, to get out and let people know all the work that's been going on behind the scenes. We, you know, this is a huge priority for the EPA administrator as well as for our regional administrator to the point that he and she have dedicated uh, dozens of us uh, working, some of us working full time on this issue. Um, we have, you know, we're working very closely with the International Boundary and Water Commission, as well as with our contractors to get this uh, project underway. We, um, some of you may have seen, we just came out uh, yesterday with our final environmental impact statement. It's 440 pages, not including uh, about 15 appendices. So I, I think that sort of uh, reflects how much work this has been. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have that on audio book, but uh, it, it promises to make for some good reading. Um, I'll go into that in a, a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I can do it, sorry. Can I do this? Uh, great. So as m most of you knew, know, we were able to sign some historic binational agreements. Um, one is between EPA and our Federal Water Commission, uh, CONAGUA. Uh, the second that really is just a reflection of the first, uh, along with a little more detail about how the cost share for operations and maintenance of the International Treatment Plant will be split. Uh, were signed in July, and then and then we had a, uh, a ceremony in August to uh, commemorate that historic binational agreement. And I think what we all recognized is that you know, if we come up to the table and, and, and build a $300 million proje dollar project, but we don't see anything south of the border, uh, it, we will not have made the best use of our money. So let me just uh, go into a little bit of detail about what that binational agreement reflects. One is the expansion of the international treatment plant. Uh, it's a doubling in capacity. What this will do is essentially prevent wastewater from entering, at least minimize the amount of untreated wastewater that enters the Tijuana River, as well as the excess wastewater that has to be sent to the coast at San Antonio Los Buenos, where it discharges uh, about six miles south of the border untreated. So by expanding the international treatment plant, uh, we will take on a lot more of Tijuana's wastewater flows. They're gonna flow by gravity as opposed to having to be pumped. Sewage does not like to be pumped uphill. And so this will allow for that, uh, for that treatment to take place. It'll actually cost Mexico, it should cost Mexico less to send that water to wastewater treatment plant than to have to pump it out of the Tijuana River at the border which you know, shows the incentive that Mexico will have to uh, fix their collector repairs, which is another project that's reflected uh, on south of the border. EPA is involved in some of those repair projects, but Tijuana is taking on the lion's share of those, of those repairs, um, as well as rehabilitation of some pump stations. And then meanwhile, there will also be entirely with Mexico money uh, building a new facility six miles south of the border to handle some of those coastal flows as well as the flows in the canyon, flows of raw sewage. And that will head towards a new wastewater treatment plant at San, Anton San Antonio de los Buenos. So this is just the location of these projects, expansion of the international treatment plant, the uh, infrastructure improvements that will happen south of the border. And then we have the new uh, San Antonio Los Buenos treatment plant. In addition, this project also includes some reuse, which I think everyone recognizes is really important. And to me, it's, it's sort of the, 
the, the real long-term hope is that if we can reuse this water south of the border and uh, it will have an economic, it will provide an economic uh, incentive for Mexico to collect and treat as much wastewater as possible because they will be able to turn around and use it in an area that's uh, in real need of, of water. So this is a significant investment of money between the U.S. side and Mexico. It represents close to a half a billion dollars uh, that will be invested in the next few years. So I'm not going to go this just so you have these. Uh, you can see in detail kind of the cost breakdown for these projects. But this took quite a bit of negotiations with Mexico. And I think it does reflect uh a understanding south of the border and we appreciate uh natalia we appreciate all the work that mexico is doing to to get a budget um i know this is still in, in the pro in process uh but to get a budget uh to to apply both at the federal and state level to apply to these projects we recognize that operations and maintenance is a real issue um, both on the u.s side and on mexico the agreement that was negotiated has Mexico paying about 20% of the uh, costs. It's, it's essentially the same as what Mexico pays right now for the existing international treatment plant. Those will continue. Um, but what's I think really neat is that we're also going to um, allow, let me see if I can, the next one, we are going to use some of that money that we get from Mexico uh, to reimburse Mexico for the operations of pump station SILA. That's a pump station right at the border that keeps the river flows out of uh, the U.S. So that will be yet another incentive for Mexico to keep that system operating uh, as, as much as they possibly can. Obviously, that system has to shut down when there's rains, but for the rest of the time uh, during dry weather, that system should should be running and operating, and this will provide another uh, source of revenue for them to operate and maintain that infrastructure. Um, the other thing is we don't want river flows to be treated at the international treatment plant. This is really uh, important. Mexico treats about 10 million gallons of wastewater that then gets discharged to the river. Currently, those flows get diverted, and some of that gets sent to the international treatment plant. Some of it gets sent to the coast. So essentially, you're retreating highly treated wastewater. We'd like to see that not happen anymore. So this uh, minute uh, prohibits that mixing of river water with wastewater. And again, once Mexico reuses that wastewater that, that currently gets discharged to the river, that will allow for a, a more efficient use of the, internet, of the international treatment plant. There's also some, um, for all of our projects that have U.S. EPA um, investment outside of the 300 million, we use the North American Development Bank to help us get that money uh, invested in Mexico. It requires a one-to-one -one Mexican match. But the good thing about that program is it requires Mexico to have a budget for operations and maintenance, as well as repair and replacement for any of those infrastructure pieces that have a U.S. side investment in Mexico. In addition, IBWC is going to be working on oversight provisions. Uh, one of the things that they wish to start, it's right now the river, I, I, my understanding is it's quite dangerous to be in that area, but they want to restart the uh, the we call them tours or inspections of the river to be able to identify areas of which in which sewage is reaching the river untreated. So I'm not going to go into any details here except to show uh, some of these long term projects. Some of you have heard about the idea of a river treatment system in the United States. That is still on our list of long-term projects. We currently don't have the money for that. Uh, all we have really in the bank is about 300, 330 million dollars. But if we were to get more money, we will. We are planning to proceed with an environmental review uh, to look at what it would uh, entail to take river out of the Tijuana uh, River on the on north of the border, then send that to the uh, international. I'm sorry, the the river treatment plan, or we call it advanced primary treatment plant and that would discharge out the ocean outfall. Uh, then finally we have a another long-term project is we would one day like to return those flows from the international treatment plant to Mexico for reuse. 
Uh, I think that's been a longstanding goal. Mexico under the treaty minute has the rights to that water. And so our hope is to work more closely with Mexico and try to figure out ways in which um, they can reuse. Unfortunately, in Mexico, it's, it's illegal for them to have a direct or indirect potable reuse project. So things like the pure water project that we have in San Diego currently couldn't be done in Mexico, but maybe moving forward, we can look at other options. And then, of course, this is the one, uh, the, the project that's more immediate, but this is to send water flows uh, for, for infiltration upstream of the Rugas Dam. As I mentioned, the NEPA has, has been very uh, <laughs> challenging, to say the least. Um, and so we welcome public comment until December 19th. And on the final environmental impact statement, this again is the first phase of, a, of an environmental impact statement. We're also going to do a start after we get this one, the record of decision signed uh, early next year, we will start in with our tiered yeah, environmental impact statement to look at things like pulling water from the river on, north of the border, uh, which we, we understand is gonna be, uh, you know, require a lot more environmental review and study. We didn't wanna slow down the construction of the international National treatment plant while we do all the environmental uh, reviews required for that type of project. It's just the level of interest here. Um, in addition, we've already started at the international treatment plant to diagnose sort of problems with the existing plant under the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. We can't start investing uh, money in a final design until we have the record of decision uh, done. But we can start by looking at the uh, problems with the existing plant, of which there are many. It's an old, you know, fairly old plant. Uh, we are also looking at a refined cost for expansion so that we make sure that we have adequate money. And then we're going to be looking for suggestions from the uh, contractor and it's Arcadis uh, on delivery mechanisms for how once we get the go ahead, the green light, do we, we, do we want to do a design build, a design bid build, a construction manager at risk, uh, progressive design. There's lo lots of different uh, mechanisms moving forward. And so we'd like their recommendations that when we get that record of decision, we can immediately move forward on final design and construction uh, because I think everybody wants to see, uh, you know, the, the shovels on the ground. In addition, uh, you may, some of you may have read about this. It just came out in uh, Voices San Diego. Uh, we were able with a small grant from EPA to install some monitoring equipment uh, right at the border. And this is, in my opinion, one of the coolest things because it actually measures, and it's very appropriate around Thanksgiving time, but it measures tryptophan among other pollutants. Uh, and tryptophan we are looking at as a surrogate for sewage so that in real time, and, and we're, we're working with uh, San Diego State University to um, draw correlations between the amount of sewage in the water and the level of tryptophan. This will allow people in real time to know you know, this, this river is 10% raw sewage, it's 50% raw sewage. Uh, that's really important, not just because it will tell us, you know, something we already know, which is the river, of course, is very polluted, but ultimately we'll be able to see the benefits from our uh, infra investment through the USMCA. And also this is a one day when we get a model, uh, Scripps model funded that will be able to predict uh, beach closures based on which way the currents are flowing. One of the inputs into that model is sewage of how much sewage is in the river at any one time. So this will allow us to do that. It also looks at turbidity monitors. And then we're also trying to get permission from the city of San Diego to install some flow monitors downstream so we can determine that when you have these small flows at the border, are they reaching the coast? That's a big unknown right now. Finally, uh, we are trying to work with uh, Customs and Border Protection. They are about to build a fence along the Tijuana River. It's about a thousand foot fence that's going to have these 50 gates that drop in when there's low flow in the river. Um, we've raised concerns about that structure, uh, A, just the 
pillars themselves, if that could cause sort of upstream flooding that could affect some of our infrastructure investment. And then if those gates sort of fail to open, obviously that creates a dam and that would, uh, you know, potentially flood or, or exacerbate flooding in Tijuana. And we also want to make sure that that's not going to have any effect on some of that infrastructure that we just talked about because, uh, you know, this is U.S. US investment and we certainly don't want to see it uh, destroyed through a project that un unfortunately, in my opinion, does not require NEPA. And you you can see this is why this project can move ahead so quickly while ours is taking years to do but uh, I think I think you see the pros and cons of of what the National Environmental Policy Act uh, does and that's all I have I'm happy to answer any questions thank you very much Doug and for your efforts on this over the years it's been yeoman's work and and we're finally making progress thank you very much for the good news today any public comments on this one Thank you, Chair. We do have one public comment. Uh, Tim Bylish, if you'd like to step up, you can go ahead when you're ready. Doctor. And uh, then we do have one additional comment on Zoom. Blair Beekman, you'll be after uh, Mr. Bylish. Okay, thanks, Francesca. Um, and do uh, we are on a time constraint. We've got to be out of this room by a little before 2 o'clock, so if you could make your remarks. Uh, I just want to uh, echo um, uh, Member Shu's uh, comments about um, health and climate. And in my opinion, climate is number one. I'm Timothy Bylash. I'm a physician, many long years, OBGYN, board certified, licensed in the state and several others, and also a research scientist in many different disciplines over the years, data modeling, database writing and use as a physician in many hospitals. I just wanted to echo uh, Member Shu because I don't think we're paying much attention. The garbage is dumping into the water for 25 years and nobody thinks that's a problem. So how about the chloramine? I'm reading a, a, a treatise on the, uh, the problems of chloramine being used as a disinfectant, for instance, very high level chemical uh, problems. Um, there's a farm up in uh, Moore Park, 200 acres, 60% of the water they use, they collect on the land. The farms surrounding it, I went up to visit it a few months ago. The farms surrounding it use 100% piped in water. Um, and so the reuse aspects of this wastewater, we create, we use it, and then we dump it, and then we try to siphon it up and treat it and put it back. Maybe that can be short circuited. So sustainable farming, using the wastewater again, that there aren't uh, any filtering of organic. Uh, compounds in our water systems at present, things like uh, estrogen, progesterone. So uh, these are some of the things I'm in the process of trying to put together over the next six months, and we'll try to present it in a more formal way. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Our next uh, public comment, I believe, is online. You said it's Blair? Yes, Blair Beekman, you can okay. go ahead. Hi, right, Blair Beekman. I'll try to keep my comments at two minutes. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, yeah, I'm just a person from the public. I, I would guess that uh, to mitigate the future of any sort of pollution on the coastlines is really an important goal. Uh, good luck in those efforts. Uh, the previous public speaker seems to have a good grasp on, on, on ways to work towards that. I hope that could be mentioned more in the future. Uh, he spoke on the realities of the situation, but uh, I, I hope that could be an overall goal. It's uh, in being from the San Francisco Bay Area, I worked a lot and lived a lot in uh, San Jose, in the San Jose area, and um, they, with the real serious questions of sea level rise, they've been uh, rebuilding their sewage treatment plant, and they've done a really fairly good job, I think, and they've come up with different uh, ways to uh, to hold the water in place for a while and, and what, what uh, soils are used to, uh, you know, help uh, lessen the effects of the sewage. It's really interesting work that I hope you could look into, uh, different soils and such, that uh, they can be a good example for yourselves. And I thought I should just mention it at this time as a reference for yourselves. Um, I think that's about it. And overall, uh, a thank you from on the previous item to speak about overall issues of green sustainability and transportation. Uh, that seems uh, there's overall good purposes to talk about the future of the border area that uh, good luck in those efforts and, and how this can be included in that process. Thank you. 
Thank you for your remarks and for keeping the brief. I appreciate that very much. Member comments. Go ahead, Laura. I actually have one because water reuse is actually my livelihood. Um, hey. I am on city council, but I do work for Padre Dam Municipal Water District, and I'm the park director at Santee Lakes. If you haven't heard of Santee Lakes, it's a 190-acre park and campground in East County, and our seven lakes are made of uh, reclaimed water. And we were the first one in the country. We, uh, we just celebrated our 60th anniversary last year. So if you're interested, I'd love anybody to come out for a tour and see what we do out at Santee Lakes. And we have uh, broken ground on, as, as Supervisor Anderson knows, he serves on the JPA for the East County Advanced Water Purification Plant, which uh, is going to supply 30% of the water to East County. That's very exciting. Our, our community is trying to get started with a, a potable reuse plant for our golf course. And I will come out and take you, up, take you up on that tour. I'd love to see one that's working. We got our bids back. They were twice what we were thinking they were going to cost. So we'll see where the project goes from there. Supervisor Anderson, do you have something to add? Did, were you going to say anything? No. I, okay. I saw you reaching for your microphone there. Any other comments here? Doug, thank you so much. On behalf of the region, particularly South Bay, where I represent in this group, um, the county's new testing protocols resulted in a lot more beach closures for my community, Coronado, and certainly recognition of the problem um, countywide is there. Um, the fact that you guys are working so hard to solve it uh, means a lot to our region, uh, both on both sides of the border, as a matter of fact. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, December 19th, you have to submit comments if you. That's right, because the 30 day comment period for the, the for environmental the final document. environmental impact statement. Right, we have it, to, it never ceases to boggle my mind that we have to do an environmental document 400 pages long to solve an environmental problem. Right. But there we go. Thanks so much, okay. everybody. The next Borders Committee meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss something? Is continuing. Continue. Any other any other any other member comments, Dave? We actually do have oh, some additional. Oh, uh, another comments. public as well. Do you want to do public first? Let's do the public first. Thank you very much, Francesca. Sure. Thank you. Bear with me just one moment here, um, Kendall. If you could pull up the video. Okay. That's yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we have a, a video that uh, was provided by uh, the Imperial County Supervisor uh, Jesus Escobar, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and play that for you now. Absolutely. Go. Serge and uh, Bill, I wanted to personally not just acknowledge and not just thank, but really a, a vote of admiration to both of you for the time that you not just served on Borders Committee, but served our communities, working not just at the border, working with our communities, but working with the tribes as well, trying to bring a, an effective coalition to our local and regional government. As a relatively newbie in politics, I really appreciated the talks that we both had, all three of us had uh, in my time in Sandak for the past four years. I really appreciate your leadership. I really appreciate your support. But most importantly, I appreciate the love that you have demonstrated year over year for our regional community. You will be missed, and I wish you well in your future endeavors. That was tremendously thoughtful. And I will certainly share those sentiments with Serge when I see him soon. Um, that was that for those comments. And then Dave, go ahead. Um, just wanted to acknowledge Sandag getting $300 million to get the train off the Del Mar Bluff. And this is important for the border because of the freight movement and getting that up to LA from Tijuana. So it's extremely important that that train does get off the bluff and it's wonderful that we're getting $300 million to start that project and really appreciate it. Thank you, David. You know, it's, it's interesting being from a small community like Del Mar or Coronado, when you see some really big heavy lifting happening at the federal level for a project that's so important to our region, um, you really got to say yay. And because it's going to really affect quality of life in Del Mar as well. But for bigger reasons, obviously, this has the attention of the right authorities, not unlike the sewage issue. And, uh, and I th it's great we're moving forward. Thank you for bringing that up. Anything else for the good of the order? Natalia, please. Thank you, Chair. I would like to echo what Supervisor Escobar just mentioned and take this opportunity to acknowledge that this morning, Major Serge Zedina received a recognition from the Sandak Board of Directors for his outstanding work as Mayor of Imperial Beach. As we all know, uh, Major Zedina will soon conclude his tour of duty, and he, he would, this would have been his last session as uh, the Chair of the Borders Committee. 
So I just wanted to acknowledge that and mention that he's a great friend and ally of Mexico and that he will be missed. And also, as uh, Supervisor Escobar mentioned, I would like to bring to your attention that today is the last day of our chair, Council Member Bill Sankey. Council Member Sankey was elected to the Coronado City Council in 2014 and re-elected in 2018. During his time as an elected official, he has been a friend and ally of Mexico, recognizing our shared values and being a promoter of our culture, language, and traditions. Council Member Sankey has been a voice of moderation in the binational dialogue in sensitive issues like immigration and ocean pollution. Moreover, Council Member Sankey is a role model member of Coronado's community. From his philanthropic commitment to the preservation of his city's history through photography, Bill Sankey has been an honorable representative of Coronado. So today, as a representative of Mexico, an advisory member of the SANDAC Board of Directors, it is my honor to present a certificate of appreciation to the Honorable Bill Sankey, Council Member, City of Coronado, in recognition and sincere appreciation of your support of SANDAC and all programs in which the agency is involved. We honor you and thank you for your unwavering commitment and dedication in the entire San Diego region. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you all for letting me take a moment for that picture. Uh, the, the relationship with Mexico is so important in this room, um, but to take it to heart because of the friends and, and relationships I have with friends, not only in, in official capacities, but also just regular folks down south of the border, um, it means so much to be able to be in a position to help that relationship. Um, I will continue to do so from the sidelines, and thank, thank you very much for this uh, kind remarks. Please express my great gratitude to Carlos when you see him. Whoa, okay. Um, I have the chair. Uh, the next Borders Committee will happen January 27th, uh, 2023 at 12.30 in this room. Uh, I thank all, all of you for your participation today, particularly Joel Anderson who came back to make sure we had a quorum. <laughs> and, and I appreciate from the staff behind the screens there to the folks that sit up here at Sandag, uh, you make our region better every day with everything you do. Uh, and thank you so very much for letting me be a part of it for a good eight years. Thanks. Happy holidays.